This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. On today's show, Eric Kearney is the minority leader of the Ohio State Senate. He's very optimistic about the president's chances of winning the state in November. He says when voters take a look at his record and they see the jobs coming back, Ohio will be in the Obama column again. The New Republic's TRB columnist Timothy Noah has written a fascinating book about the growth of economic inequality in America since the election of Ronald Reagan. He explains the shocking details and reveals data that prove that if you want to close the income gap, you have to vote Democratic. And Bill Press talks with Virginia Congressman Jerry Connolly, who accuses House Republicans of monstrous cynicism about taxes and spending. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight, and follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Eric Kearney is the minority leader in Ohio's state Senate, and he's very optimistic that once voters take a close look at his record and see the jobs start returning, they will again put Ohio in the Obama column this fall. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Ohio State Senator Eric Kearney of Cincinnati was elected minority leader of that body in January of this year, after having served since 2005. Now, prior to joining the Ohio Senate, Senator Kearney founded Sesh Communications, one of the largest African-American-owned publishing companies. He earned a B.A. in English from Dartmouth College and a J.D. from the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Senator Eric Kearney, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you very much, Jim, and I'm... I'm very happy to be here. And we're happy to have you with us as well. Now, as we get started here, let's talk a little bit about national politics. You're a Democratic leader in what is probably the most important swing state. What do you think are President Obama's chances of carrying the state of Ohio? Well, I'm very optimistic about President Obama's chances in Ohio. I think he will win Ohio. I just remind people that in 2008, People thought that uh, there was no way President Obama would, would win Ohio, but through a lot of hard work and enthusiasm amongst the, the voters, he was able to carry Ohio. He carried the large metropolitan areas in our state, which uh, proved to, to be the, the best strategy. And I think, again, this year, in 2012, he'll, he'll win the state of Ohio. I think his message of jobs uh, will will win the day, and he'll he'll be uh, president for a second term. Do you feel that the president's in any danger of losing the enthusiasm of minority voters? And and if so, what does he have to do to 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 get that enthusiasm back? Well, I don't think there's an enthusiasm gap amongst minority voters, and and people should um, take a look at President Obama's record going back to when he was a state senator um, and when he was a United States senator, there were times when the minority vote, particularly the African-American community, perhaps lagged behind uh, according to polls. But if you actually visited the African-American community, you knew that his support was very strong. And the African-American community, the Latino community, and other uh, minority groups have always been strong supporters of President Obama. They've always come out to the polls and supported him, despite what these pundits say or these polls say. His numbers have always remained strong, and they'll, they'll continue to remain strong. Is there a concern, though, and, and, and looking at a, at, a, at a state like Ohio, which is, a, a, as we mentioned, a very important swing state, what about the people that are just kind of, you know what, I'm, I don't feel like going out there. I mean, there, there was clearly a huge amount of enthusiasm in 2008. What about some of those people? Does that hurt his chances because just fewer numbers, not necessarily less support, but just fewer numbers actually getting to the polls? No, you, you know, I think that the president's strategy is is so good and so strong that that it will overcome that. And and by that I mean they're very thorough about knocking on doors, making telephone calls, sending out emails and talking with voters, connecting with voters and 
and they do it over time. It's not something that they do the final two weeks of a campaign, but they've been doing it um, in our state for, for months. So I think all of that hard work will pay off because the, the one thing that I can say about the president's campaign and about the president's style is he is a very hard and diligent worker. And I think that pays off come election day. We're speaking with Ohio State Senator Eric Kearney, uh, talking a little bit about national politics before we talk about uh, Ohio politics. Uh, What does the president have to do to reconnect with middle class blue collar workers? Well, I think middle class blue collar workers are, are a very important part of the Ohio electorate. That's an excellent, excellent question. And there's been some concern. You've seen the national articles about that. I I think the number one issue is jobs. And so the economy is turning around. When the president first uh, got into office, the unemployment rate in Ohio was, I think, roughly 9.8%. I saw some figures just yesterday that said that our our unemployment rate has gone down to 7.5%. With those types of numbers, I think that bodes well for President Obama. And when middle class, working class voters hear about how the economy is turning around, when they see the jobs, they'll they'll come back to President Obama and, and continue to support him. Okay, now let's move to the state of Ohio <laughs> as the Democratic mm-hmm. leader in the Ohio State Senate. What issues do you face in a heavily Republican legislature and is there any bipartisanship going on? Well, um, you're, you're right. We're at a, a, a deficit here in terms of uh, the Democratic Party in the Ohio Senate. There are 33 senators in the Ohio Senate. Ten of them are Democrats. And it is a tough environment, uh, you know, just to be frank with you. But, but we've got a strong core of senators. We've got great ideas that we're putting forward every day in the Ohio Senate, jobs bills, bills that address uh, uh, prisoners getting uh, back into the the, uh, mainstream of the economy after they've paid their debt to society. We've got uh, bills on all uh, number of issues. But we're we're focused on making sure that we're a cohesive group and that we we fight the good fight. In terms of bipartisanship, there are opportunities for bipartisanship. We we just recently have uh, covered a jobs bill, which um, there was bipartisan work on that. We've got some pension bills that are are coming up that we're going to to work on in a bipartisan fashion there. So there are opportunities for bipartisanship. But I have to tell you that, you know, we we fight the good fight and and we're very concerned about some of the things that uh, Governor Kasich is trying to do in Ohio. Politically, uh, America in general just seems to be hopelessly polarized with divisions by income, class, education, race, political party. How do you see the future of American political discourse? Well, I think a a couple of things. One is uh, there is a a certain amount of strain in in the way that uh, people talk to each other, and there needs to be more civility. I I completely uh, agree with people who who say that. Um, With respect to uh, income and class and education and race that that you've mentioned, we've got to get back to our you know, core American values, such as the American dream and providing opportunity for, for everybody in this country. I think eventually in the next few years, we will come uh, around to a better place. But for right now, we we are in um, a very polarized environment. You know, you mentioned um, we were, when we were talking a moment ago about it within the Ohio State Senate and some bipartisanship going on, and you recently worked on a jobs bill. Does in the the economy is it's basically if we get everybody back to work, everything's rosy, everything just kind of falls into place, and everything you know fixes itself basically. Does does do the states need to be more responsible for creating these jobs versus the federal government? In your opinion? Well, in in my opinion, uh, a couple of things. One, I think when people have jobs, the issues become less polarized because, you know, people aren't fighting for their economic survival. So so I think that'll help uh, help things out. 
in, in terms of who takes responsibility, I think it's a balance. The, the federal government through President Obama has done a good job of laying the groundwork and creating a foundation. By that, I would point to examples where he, he shored up the financial system of this country, where he's provided uh, consumers with an opportunity to, to go out and, and spend their money safely and not worry about the loss of their uh, principal or loss of their investment. And so the federal government has taken care of the, the large economic system that we have in this country. States, however, have a role in that we have to provide and accentuate and support those industries that make our state uh, click. So in Ohio, it's, it's manufacturing, it's agriculture. In another state, it might be other industries. Perhaps in California, it's high-tech investments or mm -hmm. Silicon Valley or things like that. So, to, so there's a balance between the two. Yeah, and I asked the question because so much emphasis is put on, you know, if, if the president is creating more jobs, then he's going to win re-election. And really, it's not just the president. And I think that that message needs to get out to the to, to the American people. And they need to be talking to their own local legislatures and saying, hey, look, you know, what, what are you doing for us, not just the federal government? So um, well, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Now, let's talk a little bit about your own future. Do you have any statewide or national political ambitions? Well, right now, my, my focus is on uh, completing my, my term as minority leader in the Ohio Senate and doing the absolute best job that I possibly can. I'm also uh, working on President Obama's reelection campaign. And so those two tasks really keep me keep me focused on that. If if an opportunity presented itself, I'd, I'd have to evaluate it um, as, as they come forward. Well, that's a little bit better an answer than I thought we were going to get. But uh, <laughs> Ohio State Senator Eric Kearney of Cincinnati, we appreciate your time with us today. And we look forward to talking to you again soon here on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you so much. And I had a great time and I, I appreciate the opportunity. All right. And thank you again. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up in just a few minutes, essayist and author Tim Noah takes us through the post-Reagan era of widening economic inequality in America. But right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. As demonstrated by Ted Cruz's recent victory in the Texas senatorial primary, the Republican Party's core voters have made the leap from right wing to right out of their minds. Cruz defeated a diehard anti-government, anti-union, anti-environment extremist by running as such an uber-extremist that the diehard guy ended up looking almost moderate. And for the Mad Dog Tea Party faction that dominates today's Republican Party, appearing at all moderate or even slightly sane is the mark of the devil. So Cruz not only won the primary handily, but is now celebrated nationally as the people's choice. Partisan pundits have taken to declaring that his victory proves that the American electorate clearly wants candidates for high office to hold uncompromising Tea Party values. Hog poop. In politics, the big story often is not the one trumpeted at us by the myopic media and political cognoscenti, but the one they don't report at all. In the Cruz case, we should step back from the hyped results, take a deep breath, and look at two big honking neon-lit numbers that reveal a stunning truth not only about the Texas race, but also about the sad state of America's democratic process. First, 631,316. That's how small the actual vote was for Cruz and his whole kit and caboodle of far right-wing balderdash. Many small cities across the country have more people than that. Next, 15,915,758. That's how many eligible voters there are in Texas. Do the math, and you'll find that Cruz is the choice of no more than 4% of the voters of Texas. 
This is Jim Hightower saying, America's politics has become so empty and asinine that you can win nomination to a U.S. Senate seat with a pathetic 4% of the vote and be hailed as the choice of the people. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Tim Noah is an essayist and author whose latest book examines the growing economic inequality in America over the past 33 years. He attributes it to the deregulation of Wall Street, the decline of the middle class, and, no surprise, Republican presidents. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Timothy Noah writes the TRB column for The New Republic. Before that, he wrote for Slate, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Monthly. He is the author of a new book called The Great Divergence, America's Growing Inequality Crisis, and What We Can Do About It. Tim Noah, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you for having me. You know, for almost 50 years, from the 1930s through the 1970s, the share of the national wealth remained stable or shrank for the rich while it rose substantially for the middle class. Since the Reagan era began, however, the rich are getting richer and everyone else is getting poorer. How much of a coincidence is that? Uh, Well, I think it's not a coincidence at all. We've seen a change in the distribution of income in this country. Um, We have seen a decline in the middle class, and we have seen the rise of the investor class, and that has had consequences for income distribution. Now, the growing income inequality and the lack of social mobility in the United States is striking when you compare it to other countries, both in Europe and in developing countries. Where do we rank? We rank surprisingly uh, poorly, Uh, and this was actually a surprise to me when I did when I did the research a few years ago. It's it's since uh, been discussed a bit more publicly, Uh, but uh, you know a lot of people think, well, who has to? We don't have to care about a trend towards growing income inequality because uh, you know our saving grace in the United States is mobility. We have such terrific upward mobility. Uh, except that uh, upper mobility in the United States is actually not so terrific compared to comparable countries. There's one OECD study that that finds uh, the United States lagging behind every nation except for the United Kingdom and Italy. Now, politically, isn't part of the problem that lower and middle income Americans actually believe they have a good shot at moving on up when in fact they don't? Uh, You've got to, you know, if you're a middle uh, a, a class American, you have a you have a decent shot of climbing up. But if you're at the bottom, uh, your odds of climbing up are so poor that it drags down the entire uh, uh, American track record on mobility. Um, what what is really overpoweringly difficult is to move uh, from the bottom to the top. It's much more difficult in the United States than it is in Western Europe. And you know that that kind of gives the lie to this, you know, Horatio Alger notion of, you know, the, the plucky young boot black who, who ends up being CEO. Is the American dream of doing better than your parents a thing of the past? I mean, and, and, and if so, what should the new dream become? Well, it's, 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 it's certainly a thing of the past in, in the sense of American exceptionalism. Uh, the United States is no longer exceptional in the level of mobility it provides it it lags it lags uh, uh, comparable advanced industrial democracies the, the the term itself the american dream uh was invented in the 1930s interesting it was actually invented during the great depression uh by a historian named james t adams and uh adams's life experience you know included you know he he uh, uh he lived through 
uh, the American dream when it was much more of a reality. During the period when the United States was industrializing, late 19th century, early 20th century, um, uh, Horatio Alger uh, lived during the earlier part of that period and Adams uh, at the end of that period, we really did have uh, uh, phenomenal uh, upward mobility and it was a level of upward mobility that uh, really was not managed in, in other countries at the time. Um, uh, but you know that level of upward mobility has declined since the early 20th century. Um, and uh, there's some pretty good evidence that it's declined since the 1950s. And uh, you know, it, it is even uh, a possible, it's not a certainty, but there is a general feeling among a lot of economists that uh, upward mobility has declined a little bit since the 1970s. It certainly declined relative to other nations, which have become more upwardly mobile. Uh, the you know, class-bound societies of Western Europe are not nearly as class-bound as they used to be. Is this what? I mean, what are the reasonings behind this, though? Is it is it an education gap? Is it you know that that so you have people that are left without the skill sets that are necessary to 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 grow nowadays? I mean, what's what's behind this kind of drop-off? Well, the drop-off in upward mobility, uh, you know, I'm not really clear. Its causes are, 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 are multifold. But, you know, there's, there's some evidence that when you have uh, excessive income inequality, that actually becomes a drag on upward mobility. Um, Alan Kruger, chairman of the Council on Economic Advisors, has done some interesting work on this. He's He's uh, come up with something called the Great Gatsby Curve, which just sort of uh, plots um, uh, the uh, uh, level of income inequality against the um, uh, uh, heritability of income, uh, uh, which is to say the likelihood that you will uh, occupy a position in the income distribution that's identical to that of your parents. Uh, it's a measure of income immobility. And he finds that uh, income immobility uh, does seem to correlate in a number of, as you look at a whole range of countries around the world, uh, the countries with higher uh, immobility also seem to have higher income inequality. Now, nobody knows exactly what the causal relationship is, but um, uh, the Brookings, uh, uh, scholar, uh, there is a Brookings scholar, um, uh, Bell Sawhill, who has posited that um, as the rungs of the ladder grow further apart, the ladder gets harder to climb. It does make a certain amount of common sense. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Timothy Noah, who writes the TRB column for The New Republic. He's the author of a new book called The Great Divergence, America's Growing Inequality Crisis, and What We Can Do About It. Tim, you have some bold proposals about taxation, the size of government, regulation of Wall Street, capping the cost of college, and strengthening unions. In the time that we have, can you elaborate a little bit? Yes, I think that we need to uh, we need to impose government price controls on college tuition because education is part of the answer. We need to uh, provide uh, college education to a bigger part of the population, and colleges are pricing themselves uh, out of sight for people at the lower end of the income spectrum now. That needs to change. I think the government needs to uh, say that college tuitions can only rise by a certain percent year to year. It's, you know, price controls are not a particularly great solution to most problems, but, you know, they are a last resort, and the last resort needs to be applied. Um, I would also uh, break up the big banks. Um, the uh, financialization of our economy has been driven by the uh, consolidation of banks, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, tremendous amount of resources that these banks command means that they're too big to fail. Banks shouldn't be allowed to be too big to fail uh, for lots of reasons that don't have anything to do with um, uh, uh, income inequality, but these enormous banks uh, do contribute to income inequality by um, uh, rewarding uh, leverage. Uh, I would also uh, expand early education. I think uh, pre-K education should be universal. Um, I think that's very important, and we need to revive the labor movement. You know, the, the, that is perhaps the most difficult task here, but the go government policy has consistently opposed 
uh, or limited uh, the growth of uh, uh, labor in the United States. We've seen a decline in uh, union density from uh, uh, close to 40% in the 1950s to 7% today. It's as if the New Deal never happened. That's partly because of the 1947 Taft Hartley Law, parts of which need to be repealed. Uh, the Obama administration tried to do that when, um, when it, uh, it pushed the card check law. That law almost passed. Um, they need to try again. Uh, and uh, uh, so those are a few of the proposals that I would suggest. Now, although your ideas may make great, great sense to perhaps even people in both parties, doesn't today's political climate pretty much render them just pipe dreams? Well, you know, I, I made a decision when I wrote this book. You know, I, I, there are two ways to go when you are talking about solutions to a big problem. One is to propose uh, politically uh, practical pinprick solutions, and the other is to propose bold solutions that clearly are not going to happen tomorrow but uh, that uh, discussion needs to get started on. And that's, that's the spirit in which I introduce the proposals in my book. I, I should add that not, not all of these proposals are impractical. Uh, President Obama campaigned in 2008 on expanding early education. There's actually a lot of bipartisan support for it. It's mainly, at this point, just a question of figuring out where the money would come from. Um, and, you know, sometimes what seems like a bold proposal turns out to be not so bold at all. When I proposed uh, price controls on college tuition increases, I thought, wow, this is going to be the boldest proposal in the book. Then I sent my book off to the manuscript, and before it came, uh, I, I'm sorry, I sent my manuscript off to the publisher, and before it came back, I sat down to watch the State of the Union address, and President Obama, more euphemistically, called for essentially the same thing. He, he put colleges and universities on notice that if they could not control uh, their rises in, in tuition fees, that the federal government would use its ample leverage to make them control them. So, uh, you know, I, I think we shouldn't be too hasty in, in deciding what is practical and what is impractical. Obviously, President Obama hasn't done much about that proposal, but at the same time, it's interesting, Republicans did not condemn him for it. It was a fairly radical proposal when you think about it. Uh, but he did not get called a socialist for saying we need to put a choke chain on college tuition. And I think the reason is that, well, I think there are two reasons. One is that Republicans have no great love for America's colleges and universities. And I think the other reason is that uh, Republican uh, members of Congress are just like everybody else in that they want to send their kids to college and they are absolutely flabbergasted at the run-up in prices. Timothy Noah writes the TRB column for The New Republic, author of The Great Divergence, America's Growing Inequality Crisis and What We Can Do About It. Tim, thank you so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Okay, thank you very much. And we look forward to speaking with you again soon. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and Washington Post reporter Nia Malika Henderson Talk with Jerry Connolly, a Democratic congressman from Virginia, who describes how the House Republicans are, quote, playing with the U.S. economy, close quote. In studio with us, national political reporter for The Washington Post, fresh off the campaign trail with Mitt Romney, Nia Malika Henderson. Nia Malika, always good to have you back. Thank you. And we are joined uh, right now with the Congress in recess, but still a lot on their plate that they haven't uh, accomplished and sort of left on their plate before they left town uh, to find out what's going on, what can, what we can expect, if anything, from the Congress between now and either November the 6th or January <laughs> 1. Uh, we're joined by Congressman Jerry Connolly, representing Virginia's 11th Congressional District, a good Democrat, of course. Congressman, good to have you with us. Good to be with you. Let's start with uh, tax cuts. A lot of talk about taxes lately. The Senate says, uh, in a bipartisan fashion, unusual for them, 98% of Americans deserve a tax cut uh, starting January 1, and we're going to give it to them. 
what can we expect out of the House? Well, uh, you know, the House uh, passed uh, a bill to extend all of the Bush tax cuts uh, for one more year after two Democratic bills, which I supported, uh, basically mirroring the Senate action, uh, failed. Uh, this is an issue, I think, that's going to get kicked into the lame duck session. Uh, it's highly doubtful that the Congress is going to be able to resolve the differences before the election. And frankly, from my point of view, I don't think the Republicans uh, want to resolve the issue before the election. And we only have eight legislative days between now and November 6th. Uh, eight, legis- wow. eight legislative days in September and October? That's right. Oh uh, boy, how do we get that? How do we get that schedule, Congressman? <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, there's the, there's the Julian calendar, and there's the Gregorian calendar, and then there's the congressional calendar. Yes, I will uh, be on that calendar. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Well, so it, uh, are Republicans really going to go into this election? I just heard you say this. I just want to establish it again. They're really willing to go into this election saying. Uh, in effect, we're willing to let taxes go up on a hundred percent of the American people unless the very, very wealthy get a tax cut. Uh, that is their position. The, the name Alika, go I, figure. I right? mean, that seems to. Be, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, inaction, as Representative Connolly said. Uh, only eight days left, left, and and it seems like that might be a good place for Mitt Romney to be. This sort of fuzzy inaction around around many issues, and it, and it seems like uh, Republicans are, are going along with that. Uh, they are, and it, it's kind of monstrous cynicism at work here on their side of the aisle. Take sequestration. Uh, they're mm-hmm. the ones who refuse for the first time in American history to provide a clean debt ceiling to this president. Right. They're the ones who created the super committee as a result, which, mm-hmm. of course, they guaranteed would fail because they wouldn't put revenue on the table. They're the ones who created this sort of Damocles called sequestration, which means $1.2 trillion kick in as cuts, half defense, half civilian, come January 1. And after doing all of that, they then turn on Obama and claim it's his fault. He needs to do something. Um, and, and that's the monstrous cynicism behind all of this. It, it's a little bit like the, the man who kills his parents and throws himself in the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you make? There was a story in the New York Times, I think it was yesterday over the weekend, that said corporations are sitting on all of this cash and they don't want to invest in hiring uh, because of the fear of this fiscal cliff and because of what's essentially inaction on the part of, of uh, folks in Congress. I think that's a factor for sure, and it's very ironic, given the fact that in 2010 it was the Republicans who claimed that the uncertainty of unresolved issues was a drag on the economy. They're the ones now creating this uncertainty, and it's deliberate. They think they can position this to their advantage. I I happen to think they're wrong, uh, but that's what they're doing. They're really playing uh, with the United States economy right now. Right. I mean, you're right. I hear John Boehner all the time talking about uncertainty, the problem with uncertainty, uncertainty. And th- you're right. They're the ones creating the uncertainty by the sequestration or their failure to act on this or that. In fact, Congressman, hearing you talk about those eight days, isn't this sort of setting up President Obama to run against the do-nothing Congress? Now, I know people may think Democrats and Republicans are equally responsible, but we know they're not. Norm Ornstein proved in his latest book that they're okay. not. But uh, there, there's, I mean, something can be said about this Congress and its uh, failure to act on many, many issues. Yeah, I completely agree with what you just said, Bill. I, I, first of all, the idea that we're both equally to blame is just, uh, uh, yeah. frankly, flabby thinking uh, on the part of some in the media. And Norm Ornstein uh, and Mann pointed that Thomas out Mann, in their great right. book. Uh, that actually you can lay the blame at one of the two parties, and it's the Republican Party. If you look at the 111th Congress, which Democrats controlled, it was one of the most productive going back to Lyndon Johnson. You look at the 112th Congress under Republican control in the House, it's one of the least productive Congresses going back to the do-nothing Congress of Harry Truman. So, the, uh, yeah, who ran against the do-nothing Congress and, That's of course, right. had that big upset victory in 48. What Maybe do you make uh, Virginia, important state, obviously, for Romney and Obama? They're fighting hard there. Romney's going to be there over the next couple of days. What does Obama have to do, what does Kane have to do uh, to keep that state blue uh, in November? 
Um, first of all, uh, uh, Virginia, for the really only the second time in the last 48 years, is competitive, and it has turned purple in large part because of changing demographics, changing education level, um, high-paying, high-tech jobs, especially in the northern part of the state. Uh, so, so Virginia is going to be in play right now. The president is well positioned to carrying the Commonwealth of Virginia for the second time in a row. Every, almost every single poll for the last seven or eight months has shown him with a lead. Uh, and so I think that's good news for the president and good news for the Senate candidacy of former Governor Tim Kaine. Well, Congressman, your district, for example, Northern Virginia, I mean, it's been, I, 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 I'm not an expert on Virginia politics, but I mean, you, you were able to pick up um, what, norm, what had been a safe Republican seat and hold on to it, right? Yes. Which, uh, so what do Democrats have to do uh, what did you learn Democrats have to do in Virginia to win? Well, well I, I think if, if we position ourselves correctly and tell the story of what we've been trying to do and what this president has been doing, um, I think it resonates with Virginia. Now, Virginia has done better than most states uh, in the depths of the recession and faster in the recovery. We also, frankly, benefit from the presence of the federal government. About a mm. third of our entire state economy is directly attributable to federal investment and federal spending, military, defense, national security, and the civilian sector in, uh, in, with a lot of outsourcing for high-tech services. Right, and that's, that's, uh, that's a, a, a direct benefit, so people see that direct benefit. Congressman, Absolutely, and if I could just say, Bill, yeah. and the Republican bashing of the federal government and yeah. federal employees is not a popular thing in large swaths of Virginia. Congressman Jerry Connolly is our guest. He represents Cong uh, Dem Virginia's 11th congressional district, uh, and Nia Malika Henderson in studio with us. Congressman, um, I, I don't want to get you in trouble, but I guess I, I, I do. I want to at least <laughs> ask you. So with the, Sikh, the shooting at the Sikh temple on Sunday, the second mass shooting in this country within the last three weeks, and yet I was at the White House briefing yesterday, and it's pretty clear, it's very clear, that neither Barack Obama nor Mitt Romney are willing to say or do anything about new gun control laws or tightening up our existing laws in any way. What's going on and why shouldn't we? You know, I, I can't speak for either of those two campaigns on the subject, but I will just tell you that, you know, I, I believe we can and should have a reasonable dialogue about uh, reasonable controls on dangerous weapons in America. How many tragedies do we need before we can restart that conversation? Um, nobody wants to take away anybody's right to guns. Nobody wants to invalidate the Second Amendment. Uh, but the fact, but the either-or uh, conventional wisdom we have right now, which is we, we, you know, any any kind of even discussion about it is a threat to Second Amendment rights. Does a disservice uh, to the country, and and I don't think really reflects popular opinion. Uh, we have to talk about this. Uh, and 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 build a consensus in the country about what constitute reasonable measures. Even the likes of Antonin Scalia invited that actually in his extraordinary opinion in Heller. Right. No. And and you know he said also in an interview when about uh, on part of his book tour just last week I think that some restrictions are definitely coming or and will come and it's just a matter of judging like each one individually. He didn't say no way no how. Yeah, that's right. And and even he has admitted that uh, as he you know self-proclaimed originalist, whatever that actually <laughs> means. But he himself has had to admit that the Constitution and the founders certainly never envisioned the kind the scope of modern weaponry. I mean, exactly. Does everyone have the right to have a shoulder-fired rocket? you know, a launcher in their house. That's right. And, and you've heard some Republicans and conservatives even even talk about this, like Bill Crystal, I think, uh, said a similar thing, this idea of these very high-powered uh, machine guns that can mow down uh, people very quickly. Uh, do well, you expect that this conversation is going to happen from Romney and Obama, or do you feel like no. there's, uh, there's just going to be a focus on the economy? Conventional wisdom has descended on our polity, and that conventional wisdom is to, to even touch this issue uh, is like the third rail in politics. And yeah. so, yeah. I, I, sadly, I don't think we're going to have that dialogue. But I think below the surface, uh, there actually is uh, something boiling up. And you know, we've had leaders like Michael Bloomberg of New York mm -hmm. have had the courage yeah. to speak out. Many of our uh, urban right. mayors who also see the, the results of gun violence on the streets of their cities.
Yeah, it's the mayors of the city of the country who are showing some courage on this issue, and the police chiefs mm-hmm. and the sheriffs and the law enforcement who are who are behind the mayors and saying we need to do something to keep the guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. Hey, Congressman, it's great to talk to you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and, you. And so uh, come in and see us in the studio sometime. Love to Love see. Love to you. do it. Thank All you, right. sir. Jerry Connolly represents Virginia's 11th Congressional District, very thoughtful member of Congress, and we'll continue our conversation with Nia Malika Henderson. Uh, and one man we left off the vice presidential list. Hmm, Paul Ryan's not going to be happy. <laughs> That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Eric Kearney, Timothy Noah, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to America's